Um, hello and good evening. Welcome. My name is Andrea Himoff. I'm the co-founder and executive director of Action Utah. I want to extend a special welcome and thank you to the legislators who made it here tonight. Three out of five of the legislators who we invited and unfortunately two were unable to come at the last minute. So we're very pleased to have these folks here. They'll just get more time to talk with us, which is really great. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with us, Action Utah is a nonpartisan community advocacy organization that empowers Utahns to get civically engaged so that you can impact the issues that matter to you most. Uh, we host about 60 events every year um, like these, and we offer resources and tools on civic engagement to community members. We also have leadership development, uh, training and mentoring uh, people to become the future policy, advocacy, and candidacy leaders of tomorrow. And in addition, we provide advocacy opportunities to Utahns to take action on a broad range of issues, either at the legislative session or throughout the year, every day of the year. Now, in 2016, I co-founded Action Utah because I, like many of you, uh, was just a working individual who wanted to get more engaged, make more of a difference, kind of get off my couch and, and um, do something that meant something more. And I founded Action Utah in order to help people like me learn how to get engaged. Maybe people who don't know what to do, where to go, or how to do it. So Action Utah um, has been around for about three years now. We're coming up on our third birthday. We now have over 6,000 members around the state from both sides of the aisle. We represent 100% of the congressional districts and 98% of the state legislative districts. And I have to say, it's been quite a privilege to work with legislators, advocates, but particularly community members, helping them get engaged and seeing what an incredible difference they can make through civic engagement. And we see how speaking out and having a voice really can impact a lot of important things like healing polarization and hyperpartisanship, creating um, balance with uh, some of the extremist voices that can sometimes dominate political conversations, and creating a greater alignment between constituents and their elected officials. So we're really glad that you guys are here tonight to learn a bit about this because we believe that at the end of the day, civic engagement can truly lead to better policy um, that represents our beliefs and needs and can also lead to greater trust in government. So tonight, um, we're gonna talk about one of the ways to get civically engaged. There's probably millions of ways. Um, we actually have a little uh, brochure at the front of the room that gives you some suggestions for how to get civically engaged. We break it down into five categories, getting educated, for instance, coming to an event like tonight's, taking action, voting, 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 building relationships, and even possibly running for office. But tonight we're gonna focus on building relationships, and specifically building relationships with these folks at the front of the room. Um, I'm gonna do a quick overview on what the state legislative session story. is, and then we're gonna dive straight into our panel because I know you really wanna hear more from them than you wanna hear from me, and then we'll leave plenty of time at the end for your questions. So what is the state legislature? Just like in Congress, our legislative body here in Utah is made up of the Senate and a House of Representatives. There are 104 total state legislators who are part-time elected officials charged with making our laws and appropriating our funding. And we are each represented by one state senator and one state representative. So of the five folks who represent the Park City area, you are each represented by two of them. If you don't know who they are, you should find out by the end of tonight. Our legislators come together every year for a state legislative session that lasts for only 45 days. It's very fast, and it occurs at the end of January through the middle of March, and this is the time when they come together and they propose, debate, amend, and vote on state laws and also balance our state budget. But they also come together during interim sessions in between time, and that's where we're at right now. They have monthly meetings to talk about um, the issues, study the issues, look at draft legislation for the next legislative session, um, and meet with community members, hear from community members, 
This is the ideal time of the year to be meeting with and talking with your elected officials because they have a lot more time now for a meeting than they do during the legislative session when they are busy pretty much 24-7. So that's why we held this event tonight, for you to start to get to know them now. Um, we do have an interim session that's coming up next week. It's a day of committee hearings that are open to the public on Wednesday. Action Utah will be there, as we always are, hosting our monthly tour and talk. We're going to have a spotlight on air quality issues. So you're welcome to join us, and I highly encourage you to attend, either in person or online, and see what's being discussed in the state legislature around state policy issues. Um, we also have special sessions, and we have the privilege of having this particular event just a few days before the first special session of the year, when legislators are called to come in and vote on urgent matters. And on Monday, this special session will occur starting at 6 o'clock, and our legislators are going to be voting on some big issues like fixing some of the uh, medical marijuana uh, bill that passed last year, and um, potentially 2020 census funding and a range of other issues. So if you're interested in those issues, you want your legislators to know how you'd like them to vote to represent you, now's the time to talk to them about that. Um, Tonight's purpose is really to learn how to communicate with our legislators, which can be called community lobbying. And lobbying is not a bad word. It's just a word that means advocating and educating about an issue to legislators in hopes that they will vote for or against a policy. So without further ado, I would like to introduce to you the folks who are here on the panel. We have Senator Ron Winterton, Representative Brian King, Representative Tim Quinn, and I'd like for you guys to be able to introduce yourselves, talk about what your priorities are as an introduction. Maybe just take a few minutes each, starting with you, Senator Winterton. Okay. I'm Ron Winterton, and uh, I live outside of Roosevelt. Uh, this district is a very large district. Uh, it takes in the five counties. Um, quite a variety of opinions. Um, I found it very helpful to have uh, interaction with with you. Um, I've uh, <laughs> been thrown into the Medicaid, Medicare debate, uh, health care reform, and uh, this summer they've pushed me at a lot of workshops and that. Uh, we're not done yet. We're having to, we're looking at mental health as part of that now, and we're also still working on our federal uh, vouchers, trying to, to get a better deal than what we, we had. Um, we're wanting to have a 90-10 split, which is still being talked about, but for now they, they did tell us no. And so that's something that I've been engaged in throughout the summer. Uh, I think I've probably been to, oh, about nine different conferences and workshops and that. And this is with national leaders that are having to deal with this and, and what's out there and what's worked, what hasn't worked. Uh, there's not a lot that they're telling us has worked because what we want to do bankrupts everybody. Uh, I've been uh, also concerned with the air quality and transportation issues. And so I guess my priorities this coming year will be to, to look at that. Um, now, Brian knows this well, well but the air uh, we have a clean air caucus, usually one of the nights uh, during our interim meetings, and I'm finding that be very beneficial. Now, for the summer, I've been um, co-chairing the uh, Public Utilities, Energy, and uh, Technology Committee. And so we've been looking at the resiliency of the electrical grid. How do we make that more sustainable? in the direction that we want to go. We've also been diving into the rates that you pay for your cellular, f well, all phones. Everybody, you know, you have a 911 charge, you have all these different charges. And so one of the charges that went up uh, last year was um, P <laughs> S F fund. It, it's, it went from 35 cents to 80 cents a month. And it's supposed to help sustain um, wireless and make sure that we have towers that we can get emergency personnel out to the remote areas. That's what it was designed for. So we've been studying that, trying to decide, are they accomplishing that? 
So that's been interesting to me to, to get to know that side of public utilities. So uh, I don't want to take all the time, but uh, that's kind of what I've been working on. Um, so, Brian? Uh, Brian King's my name. I'm a uh, representative in uh, representing HD House District 28, also the leader of the House Minority Caucus. Uh, most of the district is down in Salt Lake County. I represent everything east of 13th East, everything north of I-80, Immigration Canyon, most of the University of Utah. And it comes up into Summit County. I represent all of Summit Park and the north and the west portion of Pinebrook. Probably four or 5,000 folks in Summit County. I'm the only uh, representative in the legislature representing any portion of Summit County that has a D behind their name. So. You've got a little bit of representation on the other side of the aisle. I've served in the legislature since 2009. That was my first session. Um, I'm a lawyer in my real life and represent folks who've had uh, denied life and health and disability claims. I sue insurance companies, basically. So I sleep well. <laughs> um, and I, I've enjoyed very much the time that I've spent up at the legislature. It's been a great experience. And, uh, let me tell you a couple of bills that I've got that I'm working on right now. Um, as you all know, gun violence uh, has been an issue across this country for many, many years now, and we're working hard to try to get to a point where we come up with something that reduces those and develop the public will that's sufficient to move people in elected office, whether they're at the national level or at the state level. Uh, <coughs> earlier this year, in their legislative session, the state of New Mexico passed a background check bill that uh, I worked closely with uh, Emily Walton, who is a, one of the lobbyists for our area from every town. Um, and uh, gun, Moms Demand Action, they, the, the gun violence reduction groups across the country and in Utah work closely together. She's an excellent lobbyist. She actually is from Boise, but she comes down. And one thing Andrea said that I want to emphasize, I think is true, lobbyists are really important for the process to work well. And I'm not talking about just paid lobbyists. I'm talking about people who come to the legislature and have an area of expertise either because of their work experience or because of, uh, you know, the mate. sometimes they're employed and they're paid to do their lobbying work, but they come in and they help us make a better decision as policymakers because we're generalists. I mean, you know, I don't know what the heck Tim does. It's not much worthwhile. But this guy, I mean, you know, he has his area of expertise. <laughs> we're good friends, Tim and I. I we were. <laughs> <laughs> Building relationships. That's another thing Andrea said. That's what we do. But, but you know, we, I, if you come to me at the legislature and you say, I want to talk to you about how to hold insurance companies accountable, I've got some ideas about that based on my personal experience and my knowledge and expertise. If you ask me about uh, gun violence reduction, not so much, right? So uh, I've learned a lot over the past few years working in this area, and um, people who uh, work for organizations like Moms Demand Action and Every Town and uh, Giffords and you know there are other groups. Um, uh, March for Our Lives is something that come, has come about just in the last couple of years. They bring to us information and a perspective that's very valuable. And so in talking to folks down in New Mexico, they got through, New Mexico is not Utah in the sense that it's a purple state, not a red state, but it isn't Massachusetts either. It's a lot closer to Utah than uh, we think in some ways in terms of its demographics and in terms of its uh, politics. So I've opened a background check bill with the hope that we're going to be able to move in a positive direction on that. We'll see what happens. I need the support. Obviously, I say to people je in jest, I'm not the minority leader at the Utah State House of Representatives. I'm the super minority leader. <laughs> and the point there now being... You need to Make sure you have the inflection on your words properly. <laughs> the super modifies both minority and, I hope, leader. I'm working hard to get to a point where it only modifies the word leader. Right. He's going to help me if he keeps up, you know, behaving the way he does as the elected official that he is. Am I, am I being too aggressive? You said, you said play nice earlier. I get to talk last. <laughs> anyway, so... I, you know, you can't get anything done as a, as a Democrat up there and, unless and until you have good relationships. And, and what Andrea said when you talk, she talks about establishing relationships, that's doubly true when you're actually in the legislature and you've got to work with guys like these guys. So we, we work hard as Democrats to have good results for the bills we sponsor. And actually, 
Some people say, why in the world would I vote for a Democrat? You guys don't do anything up there. You can't accomplish anything. Not true. The rate of passage for bills that are sponsored by Democrats is above 50% compared to the rate of passage for bills sponsored by Republicans, which is a little above 60%. Is it a little higher for Republicans? Yes. But it's not like being a Democrat is an exercise in futility in terms of passage of bills that are important to us. And of course, we work closely with our colleagues on both sides of the aisle. Um, uh, to make sure that we get past the legislation that we want to get past. We've got other bills that I, I'm thinking about and working on, and I want to leave some time for my good colleague Tim because he needs to rehabilitate himself <laughs> after my comments. But uh, I'm happy to talk with anybody inside the district or outside the district about your thoughts. When you come to us, with areas of uh, concern based on your own experiences and your own expertise, I think I speak for all of us up here and I think I speak for the great majority of the legislators in saying, we're gonna listen to you because you have knowledge that we don't have. We're generalists and we have to pick up information that allows us to make the best public policy from trustworthy sources. And lobbyists get reputations at the legislature. Not all of them are the best reputations but it's really important for anybody who communicates with us, come give us a straight scoop. Give us uh, the best factual information that you can think of and that you have, and you will become a trusted guide for us in some areas that are very important to you and to us. So, thank you. I'm doing my that best I can here, Tim. <laughs> I'll try not to give a dissertation like Brian, but, um, <laughs> You know, Brian said he's, he's an attorney that, that sues insurance companies, so he sleeps well. I'm not an attorney, so I sleep well. <laughs> Brian and I, uh, we rib each other all the time. We, I'll, and I'll tell you a, an honest story, and I think I've shared this with Brian. Three and a half years ago, when I first came to the legislature, uh, he was one of the first people I saw. It wasn't even, we weren't even, we hadn't started. I had not even been sworn in. We'd been asked to come down to take pictures and so forth. And he was actually coming out of the photo room as I was going in, and he introduced himself, and then he said, I worked very hard to not let you get elected. And then he said, but Tim, this is about relationships, not about politics up here. I went there because of our national exposure to politics, thinking we're supposed to not get along. And I think, and I think with all just aside, he would agree, we have gotten along well, and we do for the most part between all Republicans and all Democrats. Um, as far as some legislation that, that I have a particular interest in, taxes. Uh, I've been up to my eyeballs in the last 17 months with taxes and tax reform. In the state of Utah, uh, some of you may know I, I ran a fairly controversial bill in the last session. Uh, at the end of the day, we did not uh, take a vote on it. We had the votes in the House. We did not have the votes in the Senate. We didn't want people to fall on a sword for no reason. But we did form a task force, tax reform task force, we spent uh, all summer, we went to eight locations from Brigham City to Cedar City, St. George, uh, Roosevelt, and almost everywhere in Moab, trying to get input from the, the citizens of Utah to say what makes sense. Here's the problem. If you agree with the problem, what makes sense? And some ideas on how we reform taxes and how we address the funding issues in the state. So that's where I've kind of had blinders on uh, this, this past little bit is focusing on tax issues. Uh, I will reiterate something that I said to the gentleman who with the camera in his hand from Park City TV. It really does make a difference to have uh, constituent feedback. Um, there's been times where I've changed my mind on a bill, and there's been more times where I've changed my perspective to where I've, I was looking at the bill in one particular way, and I adjusted the way I looked at it to where it would make me want to offer an amendment to the bill to make it a little better. Um, so that upon passage it would be something that reflected what I had been taught by a constituent. So I agree with, with that even taste good coming out of my mouth, doesn't it? I know, it's painful <laughs> for you to say this. I agree with, with Brian that it is helpful. Um, we can talk a little bit later as we get into this, the best form of communication, what's the most effective and efficient form of communication uh, to us, particularly when we're in this session where we are just uh, we're really flying. We, we talk about and discuss six or seven hundred bills a year. That's abs absurd, but it's the animal we have to deal with. So I look forward to your comments tonight and getting to know some of you a little better. Thank you.
So my next question would be, you guys have all spoken to the idea that advocacy matters, that hearing from your constituents <coughs> matters. Um, in the wake of the 2018 election when propositions were passed and the legislature made some pretty significant changes and sound like they're threatening to make some changes to, to Proposition 4 as well, how would you answer this question? Does my voice truly matter? Yeah. What do you think? It does. And, uh, you know, there's a lot, a lot of people that communicate through emails, and uh, I was trying to read them all. Being first <laughs> freshman senator, and thought, well, you know, I'm going to read every bill. Well, that's impossible. They assign us an intern, and so I was p tasking him to do that. So what he would do is read it. He would give me talking points, pros and cons for that. If I had questions after that, then I would go and talk to the sponsor. And it comes right back to the relationships. I mean, <laughs> I don't know if you even remember this, but you had an instance with another senator, and you came around, coming into the Senate floor there, he was looking for him, and you grab me and go, where's he at? i got to tear somebody apart. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I think we have a very good relationship because I, I know that the D's in the Senate, they don't know my issues, and I don't know theirs. And we have be become very good friends in being able to share that. And I have respect for them that um, sometimes they told me you have to be careful about lobbyists because... Some of them are very good, and some of them want their way, and they will tweet the truth to the point where it could put egg on my face. And, and so I will give everybody a first chance to be up straight, front with me, and I will advocate for you. But if I find out that it's wrong, you lose credibility with me. And so I like the perspective because if I hear not a hundred times, but if I hear it and it's continuing to ring true, you've gained a lot of weight with me because I know I can trust you in anything that you bring to me. Now, I spend time with the county council. Glenn and I have talked many times on issues, and, and I, I've helped support and run, run for behalf of Sen uh, Summit County. And uh, so, you know, I appreciate that kind of input. And so your voice does matter. And sometimes, just like you're, you're saying on the initiatives, uh, uh, sometimes the general public doesn't have all of the information. And it sounds really good until you find out that it's against the law or, you know, it's going to bankrupt us. So somewhere in between, we have to take what we're given and what we're hearing and try to come up with a good compromise. And I think that we saw that a couple of times this year. And you're right. I mean, the special session is now to tweak something that wasn't right in the first place. But we've learned that from how do you administer it from the government standpoint. Other states have tried that. And they're, they're not really respected in the United States because what they're doing is illegal. Does the federal government want to make an example of that? Or do we try to correct it? And so this will be an attempt to correct it and put it the way that we think it should run. Uh, speaking of, uh, of the distribution of, of cannabis, and, and I think, I haven't seen the language. We know that there is a bill that will be <laughs> out there and, and hopefully we'll correct that problem. Uh, we know what they're trying to do is to put it back into the public uh, distribution system and let them work that out. But we'll see. We won't know until we actually get that. And, and I'll, I'll trust the colleagues in the, of the legislature that's been involved in it throughout the summer, the pros and cons, and, and uh, that's kind of where I come from. But I really appreciate input because I don't know it all. And uh, I look to, to senior members of the legislature that have a little more experience as to how we go about accomplishing that. May I ask for a point of clarification? I just moved to Utah this year. When you're making reference to states that are, I don't want to misconstrue your language, that are not representative or well, not supported by the, could you be more specific? Well, one of the problems here in our state is that when you legalize a 
substance which is illegal in the United States, you can't use federal currency. So how do you bank that? How do you do that? And as a government agency, you're basically telling them, we don't care what you think, we're going to do it. Other states have done it in other ways. And are you saying Colorado and Washington and these other places are operating illegally? No, I'm not saying that. Right. Is that. If we proceeded down that road and we were going to cash it, we're using federal uh, currency to do that with, which is illegal. Right. So they, they found other ways. Well, I don't think any of us realized that at the time that this all passed, how we're going to do it. So again, okay, they've had time to look at this in order to make it work right by, by the time, well, let's see, is this November 1st that it's supposed to be? We need to have a special session to tweak it so that it can happen. There are ways to do it, but in our bill, the way it passed did not take that in consideration. And so that's what I say. We don't know it all, and sometimes that input wasn't in there considering the first passage. So we'll go back and tweak it, and, and then hopefully we're on the right. I'm not finding fault with others. It's just that you say, well, they've done it and that. Well, okay. We didn't quite have their language. How did they do that? So. Thank you. That's very helpful. I, was, okay. I wasn't here for the vote, but I was following it. And yeah. Sure and, after, so. you know, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. And that's what we go to conferences and workshops for is that most states are working on similar uh, legislation. And so we can take what they've done or what they're working on and compare it so that we can be consistent and, and most of the time you'll, you'll come out with good legislation that we don't have a question on. Okay, um, thank you. So we have Prop 2, Prop 3, and Prop 4. Prop 2 is medical cannabis, Prop 3 is Medicaid expansion, Prop 4 is better boundaries, redistricting issues. Easiest one to deal with is Prop 4 because we haven't taken action to change what the voters' will was. You may see action in the next session. You may see action as late as the 2021 session to change it or to modify it in some ways. And I want to be careful on this because it's easy to paint with a broad brush and say any changes at all disregard the will of the people. I'm not really comfortable with that because there are some, take Prop 2 for example, medical cannabis. Leading up to last November's election, there was a recognition on the part of both pro-medical pro cannabis and anti-medical cannabis people that the Proposition 2, Proposition 2 as written was going to have to be changed if it passed. There were some issues that, that at the time it was written. The problem with propositions and initiative action is that it has to be placed in stone about a year before the vote. And what you find is that in the process of debating it and in that year process before it comes up for a vote in the general election, things are revealed that are problematic. I mean, sometimes they're small things, but sometimes they're significant things. There were a series of things that were problematic about Prop 2. Part of the problem I had with doing a special session in uh, November or in December last year, the first part of December, less than a month after the general election, less than a month after we passed Prop 2, was that I didn't see the need, the urgency, to have a special session to deal with it. It struck me as being arrogant on our part as a legislature. It struck me as being presumptuous. It struck me as being too difficult to do it without sending a clear message to the people of the state of Utah, hey, we know better than you do, and that bugged me. Now, if there was something that had to happen within 30 days after the election to fix Prop 2, that made me feel a little differently, but people weren't really telling me, people who wanted to hold the special session weren't really identifying that for me. They were saying, hey, we've got to fix some things. And I said, well, great, so let's fix them during the session, the regular session. <coughs> that didn't happen. Uh, Prop 2 was amended with <coughs> HB 3000, or maybe it was SB 3001. HB. Yeah, it was SB. It was SB? Mm -hmm. So we had a Senate bill that came through, 3001, that modified Prop 2. There were some things about the modification that I actually liked. There were some things about the modification that I didn't like. I ended up voting no on that bill. Uh, the more prob but, but you can make an argument that that was, you can say, we disregarded the will of the people on some substantive things, and I understand that and have a tendency to agree about some of those things. You can say, no, we were just improving some, knocking off some rough edges and making some tweaks that needed to be made. For some of the things that we changed, I agree with that. The problem that I had, the big problem that I had was more with 
Proposition 3, Medicaid expansion. That is an example, not of tweaking something, but of substantively changing something that the people of the state of Utah had chosen to, to pass as a matter of law. And I was unequivocally opposed to SB 96, and uh, I continue to think it's problematic. Time has revealed that it, it was unwise to do because the waivers that uh, Senator Winterton was talking about have not been granted by the federal government, and the federal government has said, we're not going to grant them in the future. Don't even try. And yet we continue to say, no, we've got to go through this process of delaying implementation of full Medicaid expansion until next July. That's a problem. The answer to your question, I don't mean to prattle on here, the answer to your question, Andrea, is what do we do when we feel that legislators don't act in a way that reflects the will of the people? You vote them out of office. That's what you do. And if you can't do that, and if you don't do that, you will send a message to those legislators that there is no accountability when they disregard the will of the people. So don't blame us, any of us, if we keep getting elected, having voted in favor of HB or SB 3001 or in favor of SB 96. Don't blame us, blame yourselves. Because you're just telling us you can do whatever you want yeah. and you won't be held accountable. You, you, can you add anything to that? You want me to address the same question or you want to move on? It doesn't matter to me. Well, I'd love to hear what you have to say. Uh, you're going to get angry with everything. No, I, I, I'm, I'm going to try and calm down. I'm going to try and calm down. He's calm. I, uh, I would agree with a lot of what Representative King said on Proposition 2, medical marijuana. There were some, some challenges with that from a legal standpoint. Um, that, and I agree. I don't know why we had to go in a special session. We were going to be meeting 30 days later anyway. Uh, on, on SB 96, the Medicaid, uh, I served on Business and Labor uh, Committee. SB 96 was brought to that committee. And it was a bad bill, the way it came over to us. Uh, it was substituted in the House. It was a much better bill after being substituted. That went back to the Senate and, and was ultimately what was passed. Sometimes as legislators, you have to deal with what you've been given and understand the reality of what's actually going to happen. Meaning I think SB 96, uh, had there not been some Republican opposition to SB 96, it would have passed as it was written in the House. So in sometimes, the and and in the House, I believe. And so sometimes you say, this is going to happen anyway. Let's try to make the best deal we can with a bad product. And so when we substituted the bill in the House, uh, it was a better bill than what originally came from the Senate. But uh, um, I think the original question was, how do we make sure that our voices are heard? I won't, I won't pound the podium as, as Brian just did, but uh, we have another ballot initiative coming up in 2020 on term limits. And while I don't necessarily disagree with the concept of a term limit uh, law or statute in the state, I would speak to the same way he spoke about the last thing. We already have term limits in place. Uh, yes, incumbency is a powerful thing, but so is the individual vote. Thank you. So I sometimes joke, uh, because I live in Park City, um, that I can see all five state legislative districts from my bedroom window. But that's an actual fact. I can. Um, yet, none of our state legislators are actually from Park City. So how do you, as legislators who represent this area, know what we want and what we need in your representation of us? Well, I bought a new truck, started <laughs> driving it January 1st. Today, it turned over to 23,000 miles. I have spent the last two days down at the Utah League of Cities and Towns convention. I met with... Uh, and was in a, a workshop with uh, Mayor Andy Bierman. Uh, I've, uh, today, the Mayor uh, Johnson down in Midway presented in a rural one. I try to be there. I try to be involved. I want to know what the issues are. I want to know what the struggles are. I can't represent you thinking that I know it because what you want is different than where I live. It is different from Wasatch counties. And so I'm doing the best I can I uh, was elected official for Duchesne County. I had to resign to take this position. I had no job during the session. I had to go get a job. And uh, honestly, my, my employer right now is very good to me because I spend more than 40 hours a week doing my Senate job and try to do the same for the, them. But there are weeks that I have not spent one day at work. I have been doing my 
Senate responsibilities. They say interns one day, two days a month, right? <laughs> Last month, I spent four and a half days in Salt Lake for interim. And so I have to take my hat on to, off to anybody that's an elected official. Locally, you can kind of get away with doing it here or there, but this one here is a total commitment on my part. Uh, I'm away from home a lot. I have, I'm gonna go home tonight. I've been gone all week. And uh, I've tried to mix business with, with the Senate work. Some weeks, I spent all five nights out there. And I'm representing you. I'm in meetings that I think are important to ours, whether it's the Clean Air Caucus, uh, I attended a workshop on hydrogen and electric cars. I mean, we need to know the facts and is it sustainable, doable? I think that we're gonna head that way. Are we ready? We're not quite there yet because they can't prove to me that they're sustainable. But I'm not closed-minded and so I do spend an awful lot of time trying to represent this district in the best way possible. And, and I appreciate, again, the correspondence I have and during the session, I mean, I probably was getting a little over a thousand emails a day. It's impossible to read that kind. And so again, I turned to my intern and he was dropping him in files and that. And, I, and so I was trying to vote my conscience and then I wanted to vote how the people wanted me to vote. And even though sometimes it was against what I felt bad or best for, it seemed like I had more votes that wanted me to vote this way. And, and so, Sometimes I feel really good with what I've done, and other times I go, well, if it was Ben me, I would have voted a different way. But, uh, you know, you don't have all the facts. I don't have all the facts, but I've tried to, to be fair in representation. I turn to, to people that I trust to help me see that perspective. And not like the others, my, I can change my vote. I can change my perspective. Maybe this bill is not ready right now, but if we massage it, give it, through the summer, it can be a really good bill. So um, that's where I come from. Thank you. I, I think just Ron raises some great points in the sense that there's no substitute for time spent looking through emails and time spent responding to emails and time spent coming to meetings like this and going to community council meetings and um, you know just being responsive when people contact you and say, hey, I've got something I want to talk to you about. I try and do that. I can't give the same attention to just anybody as I can give to people within the district. But like I say, I probably represent four or 5,000 folks here <coughs> in Summit County. And I recognize that some people are gonna seek me out because of the, the initial behind my name, maybe a little quicker than they might seek out somebody who's on the other side of the aisle. And I take that seriously. And anybody in this room, uh, whether they live in HD 28 or not, uh, if you call me, I'll try and make time to meet with you, especially one of the things that Andrew said I think that was really helpful is this really is the best time to talk to us as legislators. When you start trying to talk to us between January 1st and the end of the session, it's very, very difficult for us to take the time to get with you. We'll do it, we'll try and do it, but you might not have our undivided attention in the same way that you would in, uh, you know, on an afternoon in October or uh, July. So please you know, communicate with us. I think most legislators are pretty committed to the idea that, especially if a constituent contacts them, they'll make time to at least get on the phone and talk to you, uh, if not meet you in person. And I, I don't, I, I want to make sure that I take seriously, and I really love actually the fact that I am able to represent a part of Summit County. I mean, I know uh, many of the electeds up here, and Glenn's sitting there in the back of the room, and Kim Carson. And, uh, Roger Armstrong and Margaret Olson, the county attorney, is a friend. I mean, uh, Mayor Beerman, I, I, these are folks that I'm happy to uh, pick up the phone and talk to when they call. And, and so I think that's, you might very well have a great point by saying, you know, nobody who lives in Summit County represents any of Summit County. And I take that point. That's not an insignificant uh, fact. Um, it's a function to some extent of redistricting and the, <coughs> something that hopefully Prop 4 would address. I know for a fact, because I was involved in the redistricting process in 2011, I was on that committee, that there was some gerrymandering that took place with regard to the representation of Summit County, at least in the House. 
I'm not familiar with how the Senate did it because I wasn't on that side of the, uh, that chamber. I was in the House chamber. But Summit County in population was a perfect House district almost. I mean, it was within like two or 300 people population-wise of being a perfect House district in terms of its population and for reasons that um, were mostly political, I think, the decision was made to carve it up. Maybe that'll change in 2021. But uh, regardless of what you're left with, um, you have to play your hand as best you can in terms of taking the, cons the representatives and senators that you have and trying to have as much influence as you can. There's an argument to be made that, uh, and, and it, this was made in 2011, and it'll be made again in 2021, that Summit County has five, uh, uh, well, they have three House members that they can talk to, this guy, me, and uh, Logan. 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 And uh, if you only had one person representing the entire county, your power is actually diluted. Now, you can come down on either side of that argument, but it's not a frivolous argument to make that you know having three people in the House to talk to, each of whom feels some obligation to represent Summit County, actually gives Summit County greater representation. I come down on either side of that. I, can, I understand both sides of the argument, and I sort of go, okay, well, we, again, play, you play the hand that you're dealt in terms of who represents you in the legislature, but the critical thing that's important, I think, for purposes of at least the three of us is when you call, you want to talk to us, I think you're going to find, for the most part, that we have an open door and are happy to communicate with you and see things to the best of our ability from your perspective up here. And, be sensitized to the issues that you're concerned about in Summit County? Uh, I would say I live in Wasatch, on the far east side of Wasatch County, and I hear way more from my Summit County constituents than I do from my Wasatch County constituents. So you have my ear. Uh, and I will reiterate what Brian said, Glenn and Kim and uh, Roger and Chris and the mayor, um, they are in fairly constant contact with us, sharing with us their concerns for Park City, their concerns for Summit County uh, in general and on specific bills. And then I'll just, I'll keep my remarks short um, because Brian's sucking all the air out of the room. But uh, on that argument of, of, and I wouldn't argue either way, as a matter of fact, I've said publicly with both of us present on the radio right at the end of the mm -hmm. session that I think that Summit County should have its own representative. Um, you are a little over in population. You're, I think, 46,000 people. We're probably going to land somewhere around 41, 42,000 uh, for a House district. And that, I've already told leadership in, in my party that I think Summit County ought to have its own representative. Um, but to Brian's point of you have three, I think that if you go and look at some of the high profile bills that were uh, really being driven by Salt Lake County and Park City. Uh, and Summit County on one particular bill, the, the, the bifurcating of energy rates, and, and on, a, on a particular ban that, that, that uh, you guys imposed, you'll find uh, all three of us joined efforts to fight those fights for you. And I think, in my opinion, it was much to the benefit of Summit County and Park City. Let's talk best practices for community advocacy. What Start the, with him this time. So yes. Yes. Okay, Representative Quinn. <laughs> yeah. What are the best ways that people can reach out to you? What are the best styles of advocacy to get through to you? This may sound sarcastic, and it certainly doesn't mean to come across that way. But first and foremost, civilly. Yes. Um, in my traveling the state with tax reform, it was, for the most part, not civil. Um, to the point, and I'm, I'm being serious, my wife actually wanted me to wear a bulletproof vest. That's how bad it got. And that's not right at any level, uh, particularly here in Utah. So first I would say to be civil. Secondly, when we're not in session, I think a phone call is the best way to get in touch with me and the best way to get a response from me. Um, but while we're in session, a text or an email or a visit. Um, we are fairly accessible in between committee meetings or you can, we have little green notes that you can pass through uh, to us uh, and have us step out of the, of the chamber to visit with us. And I, I know all of us step out of our chamber hundreds of times during the session to talk to lobbyists as well as constituent lobbyists. So um, phone call now, text, email, and personal visits during the session. 
Um, I think that is a very individual thing. I mean, Tim says phone calls. That's not really my preferred approach. My preferred approach is something in writing, usually text or email. Um, part of it's just I don't like really talking on the phone as much as I like seeing something in writing. The problem when I talk on the phone with people is I just can't retain that stuff. You know, I'm older than him. A lot. <laughs> So it's nice to have something in writing that allows me to look back on it and say, okay, here's what we talked about. Um, but I certainly, again, if you contact me and say, can we get together in person to talk about something, I'll have my staff or myself set something up to meet with you if at all possible. So uh, that's probably the best way. It's, but it's, I mean, this is the difference between us and members of Congress is that you really do, especially for members of the House, I think for the Senators, I mean, it's about 100,000 people that they represent, which is still manageable compared to seven and a half times that, that Ben McAdams or uh, Rob Bishop or our other con congressmen uh, represent. Um, but for us, it's what, 40,000 or so, between 35 and 40,000 people. That's manageable from my perspective in terms of providing personal attention to people who contact me. Uh, and I try and work hard to do that. But uh, so I think that for me, texting or emailing is probably the best. I'd probably go along with that. I, I like it in writing because then I don't have to remember the You're conversation. You're old, like me. You're old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The white hair came from politics. But, <laughs> no, I, I like texts and emails, so I have a reference. If I need somebody to follow up for me, I can forward it to them. I can forward it to a state agency. A lot of the emails I get is people frustrated, where do I go and that. I can send that onto them. Here's what it is, because if I can't do it just as trying to paraphrase what it is. I want your passion, your facts to go to them. And, we, and uh, uh, when we get um, texts, I, I'll look at them. A phone call, um, I don't know how many phone calls I get between two phones, and I try to keep business separate from the state stuff, and so my phones are always vibrating one way or the other, and I'm going, oh, I just have to text them and tell them I'll call them back or, or tell me what it's about. And then um, when you, you come down to the session, um, I will come out, but I look to make sure what we're talking about because I don't want to miss a vote. That's what I'm there for. And if I have to go outside, I miss a crucial vote and dang it, you know. So, so I am sometimes slower going out because if, we're, if I'm waiting for a bill that's coming up, a vote and then the next bill, I want to be in the discussion because that's where we actually, what came out of committee and what we're actually, because you can read the bill before it, and, and then it's hmm. modified and so, you know, I, I will wait until it's prime time for me to come out to the hall or I'll have my intern go get you and bring you out in there so I can stand and talk to you and watch the board or listen to this discussion along with what's going on. So that's how I like to communicate, but I do not want to give anybody the impression that we do not want your input because it makes my job easier. And, uh, Great. How about any extra tips? You have suggested some already. Representative Quinn, you said be civil. That's an important tip for community advocacy. Senator Winterton, you mentioned that it's important that people bring you credible, trusted, factual information. Are there any other tips like that that you can give to community members? I, I, I would say be concise, if at all possible. It's hard to do sometimes, but Ron, Ron mentioned um, the passion. We, we have people who come to us and they want to vent because they're angry or because they're frustrated or because they feel that they're not being heard. And I get that, especially during the session. Please, when you, when you bring in, when you send in a green note for the House or a blue note for the Senate and we come out, if you can take 30 seconds of my time rather than 90 seconds of my time, it's really appreciated. Cut to the chase, tell me what you want. Uh, and of course that doesn't apply nearly so much when we're not in session. But even when we're not in session, I mean, when you come talk to us and we set up an appointment, I'll rarely give anybody more than 20 or 30 minutes. I just don't have the time. And I figure, and I ask my staff to let people know what the time limit is so that they can be prepared to be concise in presenting to me in a very specific way 
uh, preferably with something that I can leave with me in writing so that I can remember it and act on it later, um, what it is that you want to talk about. And during the end of the session, the difference between 30 seconds and 90 seconds is one vote in three. Yeah. I mean, we couldn't pass three bills in yeah. 90 seconds. Yeah, no, it's it true. Fast. Well, the other thing, uh, along with what uh, Brian's saying, is that uh, to have people come, you got to fix this. You need to do something about it. You know, give us some suggestions. Be poignant enough to say, do this and this and this, and then we can do it. But that's the last thing is to add one more problem to us that we're being problem solvers with no solution. Give us some options or what you would like to see happen, and then we can dive directly into the problem. But if we have to start with this general, general problem, it's going to be a while. So that, that would be my suggestion, is let's just be direct to the point. Okay, so next question, uh, before I open it up to the audience, uh, is how do we hear from you? What things can we do to find out what you're working on? Do you have email lists? Do you post on social media? Do you give town halls? I, I post a lot on, uh, that's a great question. Now you, <laughs> and thank you for saying, do you do this, that, or the other, because now it raises all those things. I'm on Twitter a lot. There's probably nobody in the le in the legislature that has uh, that tweets more, has more. Well, Todd Weiler. Weiler tweets more. <laughs> but you know what? I have more followers than than Weiler. Uh, I put a lot on Twitter. I put some on Facebook, but quite honestly, I don't like Facebook much. I, I post stuff there occasionally, and then I ignore it. So if you think you're going to engage me in a conversation on Facebook, it ain't happening. The best way to see what I'm thinking about in terms of a day-to-day -day sort of is King posting about anything political is to look at my Twitter feed. We, I have a weekly, uh, during the session, I have a weekly email that goes out to people on my email list, and I probably have seven or 800 folks on that, mostly constituents. But anybody's free to sign up for it. And if you sign up and say, send me your email, we'll just send it out automatically. Um, there was something else that you... Town halls. Town halls. We, we, we do town halls at least two or three a year. I usually combine my town halls with people who are in the area. During the session, we have a town hall for the Salt Lake downtown area uh, uh, at LDS Hospital on the second or third week. And then we also have a town hall for the Sugar House area that involves Gene Davis, who is the, the senator out there, and Jane Iwamoto uh, at the Sugar House Library. Uh, I have events like this. I try to go to community council meetings. If you're not going to your community council meetings, you're missing out. This is where stuff, really important stuff that affects the quality of your life happens. And it's a great way to get involved. Uh, it's small, it's informal, it's not stressful. You're not going to feel like it's stuffy. I mean, you get some uh, fireworks. It's really quite fun. <laughs> Parking and dogs. Let me give you an example. Parking and dogs, man. Zoning. Got to get people excited. It's true. Like, like tax reform. <laughs> so, so I, I, oh, one, other, one last thing. We're going to, as a caucus, put together a bi-weekly newsletter that will go out from the caucus. If you want to be a part of that, uh, let me know. Sign up for my own personal email uh, if, or just let me know, hey, put me on your email list. Because we will, as a Democratic, House Democratic caucus, be sending out every other week. Uh, a newsletter that talks about what we as House Democrats are doing. What's your email? Brian at BrianSKing.com is my personal email. Honestly, that's the best one to reach me at uh, when, you're, when we're not in session. When we're in session, the legislative email, BrianSKing at le.utah.gov is the best way to reach me. And the only reason for that discrepancy, that difference, is exactly what Ron said. I got someone who's looking at that uh, government email, my legislative email, every day, all the time. Uh, when I'm not in session, I look at it, but I don't look at it or see it as regularly and as frequently as I see my personal email. Uh, we do newsletters every week when we're in session as well. Uh, do email blasts. I have about 6,000 uh, on my email list, 6,000 addresses. I, I'm going to kind of go back to one thing about when when you email us, we get, at least I get, and I'm sure everybody does, but maybe because of certain bills or certain committees, I don't know, it's, it's more. We get emails from all over the place, out of state, a lot, uh, or, or a 
someone who's uh, down in Salt Lake in Brian's district, and he won't listen to them, so they email me. <laughs> Undoubtedly, because they're a darn Republican. <laughs> so if you could, in, in the very top subject line, if you'll put, hey, I live in Park City, or hey, I live in Summit County, or hey, I live in Heber City, so that we know, pay attention. Because, I mean, Ron said a 1,000 a day. You, you really have no grasp until you're there of how many emails we get, and 90% of them really have nothing to do with what we're working on and focused on for our constituency. Well, so. and they, and, and, sorry to interrupt, but they, you always to, do. To, <laughs> to echo what, what Tim said, I pay attention in a qualitatively different way to emails or communications from my constituents as opposed to non-constituents. Right. And that highlights the critical importance of what Tim's saying. Tell me where you live. Especially tell me where you live when you are my constituent, because I don't want to ignore you. If you're writing to me from Enterprise or from, you know, Randolph or from Sandy, I may say I can't handle it, especially when I'm in the middle of the session. But if you're writing from HD28, I want to know you're writing from HD28. Otherwise, you may get ignored. Sorry. No, it's just, I mean, it's just a reality, for good or for bad, it's a reality. No, I concur with both of them. Uh, I want to see the letter signed or identified as being in District 26 because we get so many chain letters and they go to every legislator. And to me, I'm not gonna read them unless it came from somebody I know because I don't have time to read chain letters. Um, I, uh, during my campaign, my Facebook was banned because it was political and they froze it. I send letters home. I, through email, I think he, there's about 4,500 on the list right now. Uh, this last uh, month, I think we had about 15 come back. Um, if you want that, yeah, definitely get a hold of me, send me an email so we can put you to, we'll, we'll give you an update of what's happened during the interim and what I'm working on, uh, issues that are there. Um, I have a personal Facebook. I don't get too involved in Facebook. I sometimes will go and look and see what's happening in the area of people that have friended me, but I don't engage. That's not the place for it. Let's engage like civil people, one-on-one, -on -one, and I, I certainly will make every effort to either meet you somewhere, come to your home, meet you at the Capitol, but uh, I want to be able to put a name with a face. That means a lot more to me. And I don't know, uh, up here, uh, the networking, our relationships are very important. And I want that kind of relationship with the people that I represent. Because now you're not just a name or a number. We know who we're doing. Okay, I want to open it up for questions from the audience. Okay, gentleman in front. Thank you. My name is Ed Rutan. My wife and I have been residents of Pinebrook for 15 years. I'm a retired lawyer who sleeps well at <laughs> I want to begin by thanking the three of you for coming tonight, and more importantly, for your, for your service to our community. You know, you really do. I appreciate it. I came tonight because I had some things I wanted to say to Representative Wild about the House Rules Committee. Uh, I recognize that political officials' schedules change all the time, so I'm, I'm not criticizing him for the fact that he's not here. But what I would wonder would be if you could request him to find a way to find time in his schedule to be able to talk with or see, I don't know if there are others here in the audience yes. tonight who specifically came to talk to him, but I think uh, if he would be willing to do that, we would absolutely appreciate that. I'd be very can, happy to communicate. Can I ask just for my benefit, what? comment were you going to make to him about house rules? Oh, I wasn't going to stop. Oh, okay. There. All right. My apologies. <laughs> uh, one of the other things that I'll mention is that I'm on the board of the directors, board of directors of the Gun Violence Prevention Center of Utah, which is one of the organizations that's been very actively involved. So I'm going to start off with data because I know that the Utah legislature has talked about becoming more and more reliant on data. Since 1999, the rate of death from firearms has increased almost 50%. In 1999, it was uh, 9.4 per 100,000. 2017, it had increased to 14 per 100,000. In 1999, we were better than the rest of the country. Today, we're worse. 
This is a really serious problem for our state, and it's getting worse. The two most important bills in the last session that could have had a significant impact on protecting Utahns from gun violence, universal background checks introduced by Representative King, and the extreme risk protective order bill, both died in the House Rules Committee. They didn't even get to the floor for a vote. <coughs> and I think in a situation where we have a problem as serious as that, it's just unacceptable that major legislation <coughs> can't even get out of the Rules Committee. Those bills hopefully will come up again this year. Representative King said that he would uh, be introducing universal background checks. And I'm hearing through the grapevine that the Extreme Risk Protective Order Bill of Red Flag Law is going to be introduced as well. And I'd like to ask the two of you of what your <coughs> position is on universal background checks, Extreme Risk Protective Order. Are you going to support those bills if they come up? And if you're not, what are you going to do about protecting Utahns against gun violence? Let me go first. So let me clarify something. When you were talking about House Rules, was that what you were referring to as Rules Committee? Yes, getting rules bills out? Okay. And I just leaned over to Brian because I did not remember his universal background check bill this year. I said, did that bill ever get out of committee? And he said it was just late in the came, session. Came in very late. And, and that's part of the reason that it didn't get out. Um, I would support, dependent upon the language, but I think I would support uh, a universal background check piece of legislation. Um, I don't... I, my son is, uh, I have two handguns. One was my deceased father's that gave to me um, when he passed, before he passed away. I'm not a hunter. I don't have rifles in my home, but I don't have a problem with them. But my son is very active with gun ownership. And <coughs> I was talking to him about universal background checks and said, if I go to Cabela's, I'm just picking somewhere, and I buy a gun and they do a background check, what's different about that? And if I go to a gun show or if I buy it from you because you advertised on KSL. And I thought I was going to get some pushback from him. So I was geared up for a good fatherly son argument. Uh, and he said, Dad, I don't have a problem with it either. So I'm, I am supportive of universal background checks. As far as the red, flags law, the red flag law, it depends upon the language because I don't want to do something that infringes upon due process. And you have to be very careful, I think. I'm not a lawyer, and I don't say that jokingly like we have before. But I do respect due process, and I, I'm troubled by some red flag laws that just say, hey, I'm not even sure of her name, but I'm going to call somebody and tell her she's a danger to society, and now they have the authority to go and take her guns from her. There needs to be a credible reason. There needs to be a, some process, much reduced, I agree, because courts are overburdened with everything else. A very fast-track process to make sure that, that, that I had the right, I have enough inside information uh, I have a real concern, other than just she cut me off in traffic, so now I'm going to call on her. But if it's if it's worded properly, I could support a red flag law. Please explain what you what you meant when you said it came in late, so it didn't get out of committee. So we have 45 day session, and during that entire time, bills are as they're drafted come in they're in, in, introduced for consideration. <clears throat> Just to explain the whole process right there, because I think that's where people lose. So, so the three of us have a bill that we bill file. That we think it's a great idea. We talk to our legislative research and general counsel's office and say, "I want to open a bill file. I want to have you draft a bill on this particular topic." Now, to take my background check bill, I didn't provide the information for a variety of reasons to ledger research and general counsel to allow them to draft it until about the first or second week into the session. And by that time, they're behind the eight ball in terms of drafting a lot of other bills. I finally got the bill out from our Legislative Research and General Counsel's office in drafted form with only about four or five days left in the session. It was put into the Rules Committee, and the Rules Committee sort of, I went and talked to the Rules Committee chair and said, won't you let it out? And there was some resistance to letting it out. What Ed's suggesting that there was some resistance in the Rules Committee is accurate. But I said to them within a couple of days before the last standing committee meetings, let it out of the Rules Committee to a standing committee for me to talk about the committee chair about the possibility of having it heard in committee. It wasn't able to get heard because it was literally the last day that they were having committee hearings. So to the compare and contrast is I opened that bill file this year in May or June. 
and I said to our bill drafter, look, here's the New Mexico bill. I want you to draft it in Utah form in the way that um, we will find acceptable to put the same substance into consideration for us to debate. She's not gotten back to me yet with it. <laughs> and it's because they're busy too. Now I just emailed her last week and I said, hey Esther, where are we on drafting the background check bill? Because <laughs> I want this to come out in plenty of time to just have a public discussion about it. So the bottom line is uh, that's what we meant, that's what I meant by coming out too late. I don't see that happening uh, this year in this session. It'll come out, it'll be ready to be introduced uh, on the first day of the session, I think. I just wanted to tell you, Ed, I texted, while you were talking, I texted Logan and said, hey, do you know Ed Rutan? He wants to talk to you personally. He was hoping to chat with you tonight. Uh, can I send you his contact information? And he wrote me back, he texted me back and said, I'd appreciate that very much. So give me your contact information, I'll let know. Well, I, I would be supportive of a background check. I mean, we do it in a lot of other areas. I mean, I, I have a part-time, I'll call it a job, for the state of Utah. And it has to do with issuing driver's licenses to, or test commercial driver's license uh, people that are, have their learners and then they have to go through and test. I have to go through a background check and for, for that. Yeah. And I look at all the other things that I have no problem supporting a background check at all. I think we ought to know, but I won't go to the point of saying we've got to see if they're mentally stable too, because that's not part of the background check unless you've drafted something different. No, We're not addressing that. And it seems to me like that is an area where we need to be aware of, but we're going to infringe and place judgment on individuals that we shouldn't. So I, I will support a background check for guns. I, I have uh, two sons that, that carry gun, and they have good reasons. I have uh, three son-in-laws. I have a deputy, and he has his views, and he sees the best and the worst of people. And he carries his sidearm with him all the time. Um, they tell us we should because sometimes people are not civil. I had never even considered it. I just trust people. And they said, you really ought to consider it. Yes, I have rifles at my home, but I don't have a handgun. I don't hunt. So, you know, I can be very supportive when it comes to that and be open-minded. As far as the other real, um, red flag. Per, huh? red flag. the red flag, now I've got a lot of emails on that. Please be supportive of it. I've done a little research, but I, I won't speak on it because I haven't decided because I haven't made it through that. And then the other bill was uh, protective orders. Well, the that's within inside. Oh, okay. Line. Well, that was that came up um, in one of the committees. My wife went and attended it, and she was very alarmed and said, "We need to do something about this." The, these ladies and I, I worked with uh, domestic violence in my county, and I saw the need for a victim's advocate to try to help protect them or Children's Justice Center and what they do. I think there's a real need to know and, and protect these people. And so I am very um, sympathetic to those I things. And, and so, yeah, I'll give every bill a fair shake to see, does it meet the goal? Um, the woman behind Ed was, was next, and then we'll come to you. Hi, my name is Rachel Pitard, and I like Take the time out to come to these events. Where would you 
Utah. <laughs> <laughs> Rachel, welcome to Utah. Thank you. And thanks for coming tonight. And, uh, you know, personally, I think it starts on the grassroots level, city, county. I mean, I look at, I'm a very appreciative of anybody that would be willing to go and put their name in to sit on a planning and zoning commission. I mean, talk about people that take the bullets. <laughs> they, they take it and then forward it to the city council or to the county council. They've had to be in the trenches with those people. There are over 400 committees and boards in the state of Utah. And, and if a person wants to be involved, go to the state website, look at boards, look at the open positions. We have a hard time filling them. But notice again that when you do that, there will be not a total background check, but I know that we don't want skeletons in people's closets that will embarrass anybody. We want to know your character and then you get appointed. And that's one way you could serve on the state or the school board. But locally, if you wanna get your feet wet, I'd say right there because that is, for me, I think I'm a better legislator because I started on the local level knowing the trenches and now I don't want to harm local government by mandating all these things that I, I think are totally impossible to do. And so reasoning, but that's my point of view. I mean, you guys, I don't know your background. You know? Well, no, I, I don't disagree with that. I think that local is, is in the first place, we generally underestimate and, and don't give the respect that's due to what happens at the local levels, you know. And like I say, community councils and city councils and county councils. I mean, I look at Glenn back here, and my gosh, he's doing stuff that is in, in, in just amazingly important to the quality of life for people living in Summit County. Uh, being on the Summit County Council. And so, um, I mean, there are higher profile things, of course, Congress and to some extent the legislature, but the stuff, the rubber really hits the road when you're talking about local communities. So um, I think that's the place to get involved where you're going to feel like you can have an impact that day-to-day -day lives in, the, in your neighborhood feel. And so... But, but look, I, I think you ought to do what you love. I think you ought to figure out what issues you really care about. I mean, I look at Ed. Ed has been, and I know Ed, for working with the gun violence reduction efforts for years. This is a guy who is absolutely committed to this area. He knows it inside and out. He's articulate. He's passionate. And it's one of the reasons, among many, I'm sure, that gets him up in the morning. Nobody should be sitting at a meeting board when there are all sorts of issues that they individually feel strongly about that they could and should be pursuing. So I, I think, you know, we sometimes get flack when as parents we say to our kids, uh, think about what's going to be pragmatically in your best interest in terms of the education that you get as opposed to do what you love. This is in thing, this area, civic community involvement, first and foremost, do what you love, follow what you love in terms of your interest. I'm, I think we've covered I'd rather okay. hear a few more questions. Okay. That's uh, okay. The gentleman in the back in the hat was next. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for being here. Uh, so, so yesterday we had the legislature get up in front of all the cameras and start whipping up the drama on vaping. And uh, I'm, I'm no friend of vaping, uh, but that whole episode left a really bad taste in my mouth because it turned out after the fact that these tests that had been done, done on these substances that were laid out on the table, uh, it turned out these tests were notoriously unreliable to the point where the, the laboratory won't even stand behind them. But that didn't come out when this legislature was making its, place, was making its presentation. And so, and so after looking at all the pros and cons, I kind of, you know, ended up with this bad taste in my mouth, so to speak. Uh, Okay, here's a conversation that needs to happen, but it's got off to a kind of tainted and and unreliable foot um, because of what this legislator chose to exclude and include from his presentation. Okay, so so there's been a lot of conversation here about accuracy of data, about relationships, trustworthiness, uh, people being straight. Um, and I wonder, do you ever look at your own body and see where people have sort of stepped over the line and, and 
started being less than honest in their debate and their discussion. And have you ever gone up to somebody and put their, your hand on their shoulder and said, hey, that was just a little, um, uh, a little damaging to this body's relationship with the voters? Uh, or maybe that's even happened to you, I don't know. Does that happen, and, and would you do that when you saw it? If, if I could, Brian said, Tim, why don't you answer that? And I was going to anyway. <laughs> so in the 2018 session, I don't know if Brian remembers this. 2018 session. Uh-oh. <laughs> most of the time we're fed. Every day someone's providing lunch, right? That's why I look like I look. Um, but we're sitting down in the rotunda eating lunch, and it's just you and I at the table, which frightened me to begin with, but I got over it. And I said something to Brian that I meant. And I said, Brian, there are... There are times where I respect your caucus more than I do many of the members of my caucus. You remember this conversation? And he looked at me and was like, what? And I said, because your caucus, most members in your caucus, I know exactly where they're coming from. And they're going to come from that point no matter who they're talking to. Whereas many members of my caucus, and not everybody, certainly not everybody, there are some great people on both sides of the aisle, but I said many in my caucus, I hear one thing when we're in our majority caucus room, and I hear another thing when they're in front of a group that might be a little less conservative, and I hear another thing when they're in front of a TV camera. And integrity, a lack of integrity bothers me. I would much rather be dealing with someone whose political views are 180 degrees from mine, but they're honest about it. So yes, it happens. It happens way too frequently. It has to do with games and strategies that should not be involved in public service, and I won't use the, the term poli politics, in public service, it happens way too often, and, and it's, it's a bad taste in my mouth, frankly. Um, let's take one more question. You've been waiting. Yeah, um, I'm also brand new to the area, and just barely looked up, and my two guys are the two guys not here. So I'm wondering... Um, <laughs> you remember, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Do you guys care about what I say, even though I'm across the street on I-80? or whatever, you know, uh, in other words, do I really have to be in your district for you to pay attention to me? That's yes. one question. No. <laughs> yes. The fact that you, you identify yourself as Summit County okay. gives you credibility in my eyes because I care what, I mean, I represent you just the same as, as is it Senator Christensen, I think. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and, then, and then related to that is the issue of the other proposition that that is being tweaked, which is the gerrymandering one, the anti-gerrymandering one, and I can see that Park City is really parked up. It's a blue area that could probably elect a blue guy or a girl, woman. And I'm wondering if there is going to be an independent commission as the voters wanted to, uh, to, to, to sort that out as opposed to... I'd, I'd love to see that happen. I, I but, mean, but why wouldn't it? Given well, it wouldn't because you have people in the legislature who think they can act with impunity. That's who, why. Who want to take their voters. Well, sure. I mean, this is a political process inherently. And, and so if you, if you are a legislator who didn't like Prop 4, I was a Prop 4 backer. I was on the advisory council, full disclosure. I was on the advisory council last year for Better Boundaries. Uh, and so it, I was really, really gratified that it passed. And I'm nervous as a cat on a hot tin roof about what could happen by, with the legislature. If you didn't like Prop 4, if you were against it and you're in the legislature, here's the question that you ask yourself. What will happen if we substantively tweak Prop 4 or just repeal the darn thing? What will happen? What is the consequence to me politically? Now that depends on where you live. And it depends on what the makeup of your district's like. If you're Tim Quinn, you go, this could really hurt me because Tim's in a borderline state. I mean, no, he's in a, a district that is a swing district. If you're, if you're Ron, not so much. Now, I'm not saying what either one of them would do. I'm just saying that's one of the things that they think of, that we all think about up there is what is the political consequence of doing something that may be controversial? And if you think that you can act with impunity, you're much more likely to do what you'd be inclined to do anyway because there's no negative consequence for it. That's why I say, if you don't vote people out when they, when they go against the will of the people, you're, you're, <coughs> teaching, you're teaching elected rep representatives how to behave. How is it even legal, though, to repeal 
about something that was because the effect of the proposition is no different than any other statute. It's not we we can't amend the process. We can't amend the state constitution through the initiative process in the state of Utah. Okay. I just as a tag on because the question that I wanted to ask was we there's like an acceptance that the proposition process is inherently flawed in that the the citizens vote for something and then the tension of the citizens may not be completely well informed the proposition may be lacking and that's always a, that's always um, gives the possibility that the legislative body then can then say oh well we know better and maybe legitimately so or maybe very illegitimately so so that they can seize power my question is, is on a big picture systems level how do we clean that process up so that there is accountability, so that when the people vote for a proposition, there is a compulsion that the elected officials feel much more pressure to enact it. It seems to happen in other states, and in some states there seems to be more political antics about how to wiggle out of those things, or maybe the process is different, so that the propositions actually are more weak in some states. I don't know, but my interest is in, especially hearing from people who are elected officials and see what it looks like? Like, how can we improve this so that the state, that people here voting feel like their vote matters and that it's legitimate so that the legislative body also feels that they need to respond to the voters? How do we strengthen that? You can go ahead. You, can. I, you know how I think, what I think about the answer to that question. Redistricting scares me, but my county was dissected three ways. There was no reason for it. This is in 2011. But I like the opinion that we now have three votes, and our vote is not going to change who represents us. We don't have enough in each one of those three districts to change who's going to represent us. It just won't happen. But um, I would like to see our ledge council have a whack at anything that goes on the ballot beforehand because they they protect us and they make sure what we do is constitutional that process doesn't happen with the initiative process so you know if that was in place then we wouldn't be redoing anything because we know it's already had that real fine looking but that's my opinion because i think that that is flawed in a lot of ways because, yeah, if the people speak, then if we're just going to go initiative all the way down the, there's no reason for us to be up here because we could just do it all by the voice of the people through initiatives. And, and as we find out that sometimes that's not the best mm -hmm. way because the general public is not privy to some of the back room um, talk that goes on, well, this is unconstitutional and we're going to have a problem here. That's, that's all. But I, I want an independent uh, council to, to look at it. I guess ultimately, we, we don't know who this is going to be yet, but there'll be, it has to pass through the legislature for a final say anyway. So will we tweak it? Well, how many bills have you passed that never had an amendment or a tweak to it? But that's a public process. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, you know, talk about being involved. Come down and speak in those uh, public hearings when every bill comes and we have the public process right there. Those that are speaking for the bill or against the bill. And then after it leaves the committee, then it goes to the floor. But at least we have that kind of opinion on both sides. Just so you know, the proposition, the initiative proposition and uh, the initiative and proposition process in Utah amends only statute. It does not amend the Constitution. In California, when they run an initiative and a proposition is put on the ballot, they're amending the state Constitution. That significantly ties the hands of the legislature to change any proposition that passes. So you have apples and oranges. You have qualitatively different effects by what passes by proposition in California versus what prop passes by proposition in Utah. Now. Each has their upside and downside. I know that we have more questions. I'm really sorry. It is 7.30. Well, it's good to hear from someone who's been here a long time rather than people who've just been here a short time. 
Well, I, and I understand. I just know everybody has a time frame, but I think if you have questions, there's a couple more as well that we would like to be able to have you ask the questions individually with the legislators before they take off tonight. Um, but we do have to cut the rest short, and I'm so sorry about that. And I really appreciate the questions and the conversations that we've had here tonight. I think it's incredibly important, and it's just a start. These people are available to you, and so I think that's the real message here is you can continue the conversation from here. Uh, a couple ways to do that is uh, find out who represents you at vote.utah.gov so you know which of these are your representatives and senators. Save their contact information into your contact list. Join their email list. Follow them on social media. Uh, you know, become a Twitter follower of Representative King's. <laughs> and um, you can always subscribe to Action Utah's email list to learn more about how you can get engaged specific actions you can take, more events like these. So those are four things you can do coming out of this tonight. Um, if you have an extra minute to tell us how we did, give us your feedback, we appreciate it. We use it to improve our events throughout the year. And finally, we have several more events coming up. You can learn more about these at our event page. But thank you again for coming, and of course, thank you so much to our state legislators for being here. <laughs> Are you asking a specific one? Yes. Well, I might as well be talking about it.